Well, if you're really so determined to have a fight, then I'll oblige. <laughs> Hello, everybody listening to this around the world on YouTube. My name is Ben Johnson. I am the host of the Kung Fu Movie Guide podcast. Thank you so much for checking out this conversation from our archive. The conversation you are about to hear was originally released on the 13th of August 2018. It features my conversation with one of Bruce Lee's training buddies and close friends, Bob Wall. Bob also featured in the classic Bruce Lee films Enter the Dragon, The Way of the Dragon and Game of Death. You can listen to the latest episodes of the show and more conversations in our archive by subscribing to the Kung Fu Movie Guide podcast wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Head over to our website kungfumovieguide.com for all the latest martial arts movie news and reviews. That is also where you can sign up to our monthly newsletter you can also donate to us and get in touch we are on facebook instagram and twitter and you can also subscribe to this youtube channel i will be back at the end of this conversation to sign off properly but until then here we go then here is my conversation with the great bob wall I took my wife on a six-week honeymoon, and the first country we went to was England. Oh, wow. On the second street, I run into Wall's ice cream. I go, oh, my God, this is the best ice cream on earth. I, I call my mom, and, you know, our family goes back to Winston Churchill. Wow. And Betsy Ross in America. Yeah. So I called her. I said, are these the part of our family? She said, absolutely. So anyway, we called them. They were super nice. Took us around a tour of the, of the farms and... And their ice cream operation and so on, and it was amazing. Wow, that's amazing. Does are you entitled to any of the uh, <laughs> any of the profits? <laughs> uh, no, no, but I think they wish they were entitled to some of my profits. So yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's great. Yeah, I was going to ask if you've been over to the UK at all. You must have. You, you've travelled quite a bit. Have you Have you been over here at all? Well, you know what's funny. I've been to 103 countries doing Bruce Lee seminars and so forth. But I've never been back to England, which is part of my birthright. You know, it's part of my heritage. Yeah. I'm Irish and English. My dad was half English and half Irish. My mom is three quarters Irish. So. Wow. I read that somewhere that you had you had Irish uh, blood in the family. You're not tempted to go back there, to, over to Ireland then and to sort of, um, you know, have a, have a look around there, see if there's any ancestors? <laughs> What's funny, Ben, is when, I, when we got married, uh, the, the Protestants and the Catholics, and my wife and I are Catholic, they were killing each other right and left and blowing each other up. And I just didn't want to take my new wife to Ireland to yeah. take the risk. Yeah. So we went to a 12 countries. But no, we went the other way. We went back to France, went up to Calais, and took a train into Paris. And we had a fabulous time. But yeah, yeah, I've never been to Ireland. It breaks my heart. I would love to have somebody, you know, hire me to come over there. But uh, someday somebody in Ireland or England will figure it out and uh, invite me over and they'll make a bunch of money along with me. Yeah. Uh, I've done many, many, many countries. I've done Spain. I've done so many countries, yeah. but never England or Ireland. It's very funny. You're coming up to 80 now, Bob. Is that right? No, I'm 78. 78. Chuck, Chuck Norris and I, I'm six months older. His birthday's March 10th, yeah. 1940. My birthday's 8-22-39. So in August, I'll be 79, Wow! and I do the splits, and I have a resting heart rate of uh, 52, and I'm married 49 years. That's so beautiful. Doctor That's... said, my vision's 110. Yeah. 2010, rather. So the doctor always goes, wow, you're not only our wealthiest, healthiest client, yeah. you're absolutely in the best shape of all of them, at any age. Amazing. What do you put that down to, Bob? Of course, what's funny, Ben. Yeah. I didn't drink a drop till I was 23 because my dad, like Chuck Norris's dad, like a lot of great martial artist dads, are alcoholics. But anyway, I left home at 13 with two dollars and 58 cents in my pocket. And by the time I was 25, I was worth two million. And mm -hmm. trust me, at 78, I'm worth a lot more millions. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and Chuck Norris, we're both 
probably the two wealthiest people in martial arts because we're honest. We don't lie, cheat, or steal. But I, Chuck and I did not drink a drop till we were 23 because of our fathers. But I've limited myself my entire life to a maximum of three drinks. Mm. But I don't live by anybody else's standards. I'm a Christian. I'm a foul-mouthed Irishman. Yeah. I don't punch anybody anymore because I hit harder than anybody on the planet, mm. bar none. You came from a background which was very sort of full contact and it was self-defense and that's what you were preaching. And nowadays where you see, you know, the UFC and the mixed martial arts stuff, I mean, are you, do you watch that stuff, Bob? And do you think if you were young, younger now and you were getting into the martial arts, that's what you would be doing? Yes. And the sad part is that I'm the fifth black belt in 1959 of the world's toughest man, Jean LaBelle. Yeah. Who's two-time national judo champion, uh, created MMA. In yeah. 1962, he, he put, rendered unconscious for 20 minutes a guy named Milo Savage, who was a boxer. And when I made black belt in 1957 in judo, I, I came from a wrestling scholarship. I got my butt kicked for two years thoroughly, okay? Then I came to San Jose State with a scholarship in wrestling, and then I got my butt kicked thoroughly for a year, and then made black belt. I have a long history of having my ass kicked. Right? Yeah. Nobody gets great if they don't get their ass kicked. Yeah. And there's a lot of famous people, including Joe Lewis, who I was his first black belt, and he kept harassing me about why I was that like, grappling and grappling. I said, you know, Joe, you've done the same thing for 40 years. I've done everything different. I mm. wrestled, boxed, tie box. General Che, who founded Taekwondo, promoted Chuck and I to eighth degree black belt. I got black belts from Rise Kano, Jugo Kano's son, the founder of judo. Yeah. Second black belt was Gene LaBelle, the world's toughest man at 84. Nobody. And I'm here to say, bring it on. Bring 100,000 if you can beat an 84 year old man. <laughs> I'm sixth Don in judo. Uh, I boxed, I tie boxed for five years. I've done it all, Benjamin. Yeah, yeah. After going through that process and learning so many different disciplines, is there an ultimate uh, style, do you think? No, I, I respect all styles. I think all styles are great. I think the difference is the teacher, yeah. all right? But all styles, from kung fu to Thai boxing to karate to judo, to re they're all great. They're all excellent. And they're all people of excellence who try to make it better, but... The reality is, if you only study one system your whole life, you're limiting yourself. So I tried everything. And one of the greatest partners anybody ever had on earth was Chuck Norris, which yeah. we've been since 54 years. And he's amazing. And he always said, Bob, you want to try everything. You want to study everything. And prior to that, Gene LaBelle said, Bob, go study everything. Mm -hmm. Everything has goodness in it. But it's not the system, it's the teacher. Bruce Lee was advocating that, wasn't he, even back in the in the 60s? I mean, he was quite sort of vocal about if a particular, you know, moving uh, karate doesn't work there, then why not ad adapt, you know, some elements to street fighting or whatever? Like, he was advocating that as well, wasn't he? Yeah, Bruce was a genius like Chuck Norris, like Gene LaBelle. These are three martial arts geniuses. Yeah. They trained under geniuses. And so if you want to be the best, you got to go train with the best. I, I got blessed, you know, because I left home at 13. I had an abusive alcoholic father. Therefore, I decided never to abuse. I've never even done an aspirin. I don't, I'm an anti-drug guy. My mom told me I had the greatest mother in the world. And she died at 99 a couple of years ago. But when I was a little kid, I was seven. She said, Bobby, I want you to hate everybody. And I, I went, Mom, I don't want to hate everybody. Yeah, I want you to hate everybody who chose their parents. Well, Mom, you can't choose your parents. That's right, son. Don't forget it. You yeah. are God's gift to you. Now, what you do with you is your gift to God. So I was blessed. And I had an alcoholic father, which is great because he challenged me. He stuck hay hooks in my arm, stabbed me to a tree with a hay hook, stabbed me to a post with a screwdriver, which I still have the scars of, hit me in the face when I was a, with a hammer when I was 12. And so I thought I was, you know, a, a challenge kid. But I, I rode 168 miles at 13, went to an uncle's, one of my father's older brother. 
started washing cars for him. He was quite successful. And by the time I was 25, that's when I was 13 in 1952, I was worth a couple mil because I'm a money machine. Yeah. But my mom always said, train with the best. So I only trained with the best. So I made Bruce Lee in 1963, and he became one of the best. But in my opinion, 1963, he wasn't one of the best. <laughs> you were similar in age when you, you met, weren't you? So yeah. can you remember that first meeting with him then? Absolutely. Chinese restaurant because of Gene LaBelle. And yes. I met this guy, a great martial artist, uh, an Okinawan martial artist named Bob Osman. Bob and I went down to a Kung Fu demonstration because Gene LaBelle said, go watch everybody, train with everybody. And so it was a restaurant in, in, in uh, L.A. And Bruce, it was just one week after Bruce had beat up Wong Man Jack. Yeah. Would now like to change the history. I understand he came up with a movie where he got a draw. He got his ass kicked. He got yeah. his ass kicked thoroughly. He punked out. Because I talked to Bruce Lee. I talked to Linda Lee. And five of the people who were there. And not only did you get your ass kicked... You chicken shit it out. You rolled up in a little ball. And here's what's even worse. He brought some friends with him. Now, if you're going to go challenge a Bruce Lee, why do you need friends? You're going to come sure. with a bowl. He tried to do this bullshit trip. And Bruce just said, put the scroll down and let's go. And he kicked his ass. So he tried to change history. I understand. It's embarrassing to get your ass kicked. But he should wake up and realize everybody good Everybody great gets their ass kicked. But then they learn how to not get their ass kicked. But anyway, so I go to this Kung Fu demonstration in Chinatown. And this Kung Fu guy was, in, in those days, in the 50s and the 60s, if you were judo and I was taekwondo, and everybody had the nasty say, oh, our system's the best. Okay? Yeah. It's all lead up to the MMA today. But anyway, Gene LaBelle, the greatest toughest martial artist on the planet the only man alive to pin a bear yeah. amazing martial art where they're watching and there was about i don't know 100 200 chinese in this restaurant and this deadly kung fu master and there was six guaylo uh, foreign devils yeah and and i was one of the six with bob osman and so this kung fu guy said oh i see we have karate people here i guess he assumed because we're not Asian, we must be karate. But anyway, he said, I invite any of you to come up and hit me as hard as you want. Oh, three guys went up on the stage, and now it's not hit me as hard as you want in a real fight. He puts his arm out. He's going to let him hit his arm. So in those days, he did a lot of what they call, you know, horse stance, which is horse hogwash, but they did it. And so they shoot hoed him, which is kind of a a karate chop, if you will, yeah, to the arm, and of course it doesn't hurt. And then he says, "All right, I'll break your arm. Put your arm out." Well, they didn't sign up for a broken arm, so they left. So I'm looking at this clown. I'm going, you know, hey, you can hit my arm. Go ahead and break my arm. So I went out, and he was pretty clever. He took his two forefingers, and he starts slapping my wrist. Bap, 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 bap. And I kept saying, "Well, I can't feel it." And when are you gonna break my arm? Break my arm. So. I am a sadist, and yeah. I am a retired cop. But anyway, the guy's a punk. He's being nasty, so after about 8, 9, 10, 12, 15, 20 slaps, a little welt on my wrist, and I'm going, yeah, pretty good. He hits pretty hard. So I slapped him once with my right arm, and he spun around, fell down, and pretended he was unconscious. And then I realized I still had my scotch and soda in my left hand. And I looked at the crowd, and today I could do five hours of humor. But then... I didn't have a joke one, and I'm going, oh, man, I'm about to be killed. So I walked off quickly to Bob Osman, and Bob with gritted teeth said, let's get out of here quick. They're going to kill us. So we started heading for the door, and I'm looking around left, right, in my paranoid stance, and, and uh, this guy, tough-looking guy, walks up, sticks his hand out, and he says, hey, I'm Bruce Lee. That was so funny. You're as cocky as me. That's how I met Bruce Lee. <laughs> he, know, he found a kindred spirit there, then. Well, he said he wanted to do the same thing I did, except that he was a Kung Fu guy. And he kept saying yeah. it's Kung Fu. Now, what did you know, Bob, about Kung Fu at that stage? Did it seem quite exotic uh, at that time? No. The bottom line is that Teddy Roosevelt, our American president, 
who wound up being a black belt in judo, really brought judo to the United States. Within ethnic communities, the Chinese had kung fu, the Japanese had karate, and so on and so forth. But it was kept within ethnic communities. But because the president studied judo, that made it spread. At that point, I had not studied kung fu. But remember what Gene Lavelle told me, my second black belt, 1959, he said, study everything. Yes. So now I meet Bruce, and now I, we studied together, and he was brilliant at what he did. But in my humble opinion, he was relatively limited in his skill set. The mm. stuff got from Yip Man, very limited. A lot of people, when they refer to Bruce Lee, as they think of him as the best sort of studier of martial arts. But whether he was a great martial arts fighter is hard to tell because he wasn't. He didn't compete. He did, it wasn't as if he had a lot of world titles or anything like that. And he, he very much came from a different background. There. What's your What's your thinking around that? On that point, Bruce had no world titles except one from the greatest martial artists on earth. Bruce Lee was the world's greatest film fighter. Yeah. He was a serious street fighter, but he never did MMA. He never did kickboxing. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Look, there's lots of different kind of fighting. MMA is totally different than point fighting. And point fighting is different than film fighting. And film fighting is different than street fighting. And on and on and on and on. So... Certain people have skills in certain sets, but in my opinion, my humble opinion, nobody yet, 44 years after the master's death, has ever even come close to being as great as Bruce Lee, the greatest film fighter of all time. Was he a tough guy? you darn right. Trained with Gina Bell, Chuck Norris, and me, and Joe Lewis. He trained with some of the best ever. Did he learn techniques from us? You betcha. Did we learn techniques from him? You betcha. He taught Chuck and I particularly film fighting. Yeah. The string, you know, being able to, to relax, the opposite of real fighting, where you never show anybody you hurt, but you had to relax your neck and your shoulders, and you had to get the angle correct, and you had to relax your neck and your shoulders and your body, and you had to show the pain and show the impact. That's not what you do in real fighting. Bruce Lee was a genius at, and he trained Chuck and I in that. But yeah. you can't be next to a master of anything. I don't care if it's painting or computer and not learn something from them if you do what my mother said. God gave you two ears and one mouth because he wanted you to listen twice as much as you speak. Yeah. So listen. So my blessing was that I got to know the young Bruce Lee. He was one year younger than me to answer your question. He died at 32. I was 33 when he died. Yeah. Uh, he was like Chuck Norris, born in 1940. But he was a great man. I loved the man. He was funny. He was brilliant. He was well-read. He married... The best wife on earth for him, Linda Lee. She was a great wife for Bruce Lee. You would go and visit them and train with Chuck Norris. I know Mike Stone, Joe Lewis, you were all sort of buddies. You must have very fond memories of, of that time, Bob. Is that is, is that fair to say? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Chuck Norris and Mike Stone and Joe Lewis were the top three fighters of their era. Yeah. But Mike Stone, who'd won everything, but he only competed in 12 tournaments. Mm. So it's a relatively short career. And um, but he was the champion. Right. And then after them came along Chuck Norris and Joe Lewis. Well, they all kind of resented each other. They were not friends. They were all friends of mine. So I'd go to Mike Stone and I knew him and I said, Mike, that Joe Lewis thinks you're the greatest. He does. Yeah. And I go to Joe Lewis. I said, that Mike Stone thinks you're the greatest. I go to Chuck Norris. Yeah, that Mike Stone thinks you're the greatest. Oh, that Chuck Norris thinks you're and so forth. I got them to be friends. You understand? Yeah. Because I took away the bullshit because they were all friends of mine. So the fact is Mike Stone trained with Bruce after, way after he was world champion. Yeah. Norris trained with Bruce Lee and Joe Lewis with Bruce Lee after they were world champions. Yeah. Bruce had certain skill sets that others didn't have. He was brilliant. He challenged those who were stuck in the norm. Yeah, did you not find that slightly offensive at the time? Or were you all just like, yeah, he's got a point. He's, he's absolutely right. Well, first of all, his predecessor, the world's toughest man, Jean LaBelle, said the same thing way earlier. Yeah. The difference is they were both smart, 
brilliant people who called it as it was. So Bruce just came along a little after Gene. Remember, Gene made Black Belt at the time he was 14. Wow. When he met Bruce Lee, he was way into his 50s. Yep. So the bottom line is, no, I did not find it offensive. I found that exciting. He was saying how it was. Yeah. He was saying how it was not. And because of Gene LaBelle and Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and Mike Stone and a few others, there became MMA. Joe Lewis, I, I love Joe. He was my first partner. He was the first world heavyweight kickboxing champion. Handsome dude. I mean, six feet tall. Yeah. Adam, he was 235. He was the first world kickboxing champion. He created kickboxing in America. Yeah. And the guy was just clean as a bean and healthy and everything. But then he got into the movie business, and after we were partners, when Chuck Norris bought him out, I bought a, a school in Sherman Oaks, and I gave Joe half of it because he was from the Marine Corps. He didn't have $5, and I was already wealthy. So I gave him half of the school, and then a couple years later, you know, he'd break 20 noses. I'd enroll 20 students. I had enrolled 20 more. He'd break 20. My Joe, they don't come here to be hurt. They come here to learn how not to be hurt. Yeah. So I said, I'll give you the school. I'm out of here. Oh, no, 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 I, without you, I don't want to be here. Okay. So I s went to Chuck Norris, and I said, I want to sell the school. He said, I want you. I don't care about the school. We became partners. Yeah. So that's in the 60s. That's sort of 67, 68, is it? You and Chuck Norris go into business together. You open up a string of uh, martial arts school. This is in California. Yeah, yeah. 1966, yeah. when Chuck bought out Joe Lewis. Yeah. And we ended up building the largest chain of martial arts schools in the world. Yeah. I don't think anybody's done it today, 182 schools. Wow. I got the best partner on the planet. And Joe was great. I love Joe. He was a great fighter, but he couldn't quite get his personal life together. But Chuck Norris always had it together. Yeah. He's a true Christian. His word is gold. He's an amazing man. Yeah. Do you still see him, Bob? Do you see him often? Absolutely. Not yeah. often enough, because now he moved to Navasota, Texas, but I'd love to see him every day like we used to for years. But yeah, yeah I yeah. just, uh, we just came back from June Rhee's funeral, another great martial artist. Who yeah, we lost, we lost June Rhee. I know that's sad, isn't it? Oh, you know, that's beyond sad. 86 years old. I used to love it when he came to my house, but I loved it more when he left, because that sucker would want to do a thousand push-ups yeah. instead of... <laughs> My wife says, you're happier when you leave. I, yeah, I don't want to do a thousand push-ups and yeah. sit-ups. But he, he was an amazing guy. Philosoph philosophically, technique. I introduced him to Bruce Lee, and they became real close. Yeah. And I was there when Bruce sidekicked him over in a couch in his house in Virginia. And then and then Julie got up and kicked Bruce in the head with a round kick. It was so funny. Yeah. But they were buddies. They connected on the Asian level, Korean and Chinese. Yeah. But they were fellow martial artist, and Linda was back, Linda Lee, of course, my love and adore, Bruce's great wife, was there, and I got to introduce him to Chuck and Gina Norris, which was fun for me, because all these years, they didn't know each other, but yeah, it was very sad, there was, I'm telling you, it had to be over 3,000 people, wow. everybody virtually was anybody in martial arts history in America was there, because of the respect they had for June Rhee, I mean, Jeff Smith, Light heavy world champ, Joe Corley, who fought uh, Bill Wallace at nine rounds. Everybody who was anybody was there out of one word, Ben, respect. Yeah. And Bruce, he couldn't show up, but his widow did. Yeah. Show respect to June Rhee, one of the greatest martial artists of this country, just like Bruce Lee, his buddy. Yeah. But June Rhee is always, and because he's credited as sort of, uh, you, you know, being the voice and helping to popularize Taekwondo within America. But in the 60s, like you and Chuck Norris, what you were doing in opening your schools and making karate more accessible, it seems like you were on a similar wavelength in making it accessible for ordinary people to go along and do this. Do you do you agree with that? Or am I am I elevating that somewhat? What do you no, think, you're, Bob? You're, you're absolutely correct. What Chuck and I did that was different than everybody else on the planet. Nobody. I challenge anybody to prove to me that anybody before Chuck Norris and Bob Wall specialized. We only paid attention to women and children. We felt women and children needed martial arts more than anybody. I would teach 
uh, the black belt class, Chuck would teach the kids class. In the next school, I would teach the kids class, he would teach the boys. We love teaching kids and women. Yeah. He's my wife, 1964, we got married in 68, but she went through our first blue belt promotion. And it was different than everybody else's promotion because it wasn't about rank, it was about skill. Chuck Norris, greatest partner anybody could ever have. He's honest, he's hardworking, he's an amazing martial artist. And he got you in the movies, didn't he, Bob? So Bruce Lee calls him up, I'm making a movie in Rome, I want you as the bad guy, and then Chuck says, you know, Bob's Bob's coming along for the ride. Is that is that how it sort of works in a, in a nutshell? Not exactly, Ben, no. but we'll clean, <laughs> we'll clean up the facts here. Yeah. We were at our Torrance school. Chuck was determined to teach me those crappy katas. I'm not a kata guy. I'm a fighter. But I had to learn Gicho Hyung, Sobu, Sangup to Basai. Anyway, we were working on Basai at that particular That was the black belt uh, form. I had to learn. I'm hating every minute of it. Anyway, we get through the workout, and Bruce had called Chuck. And Chuck Norris was Bruce Lee's favorite absolute martial artist. Even though Bruce and I trained a lot more, and I showed Bruce Lee a lot more, I taught him the crescent kicks. I have so many pictures. But anyway, he said, hey, Bruce wants me to be in a movie. I'm going to do a movie called Way of the Dragon and I'm going to Rome. And I said, you're not going without me, pal. We're 50 partners. So I paid my own way. Yeah. All right. Now, I get there on the plane. We're in coach, of course, because <laughs> the budget was pretty low for Way of the Dragon. It was 250 And so, anyway, we're coach. On the flight over there, Bruce uh, Chuck says to me, do me a favor. He said, Bruce wants me to walk out ahead of the first-class passengers, and I don't know how to do that. No problem. I'll go up there, and I'll talk to the uh, head flight attendant, and I'll just say, we need a moment, you know, just to have you walk out. Because in Way of the Dragon... When Chuck Norris walks off the plane, that's exactly the plane we flew from America into. No way. Really? So I went up to the front, and I, was, I charmed the, the purser, the flight attendant, the head flight attendant. And I said, look, do me a favor. We're doing a film. It's low budget. And we need this guy back here. And she didn't know who Chuck Norris was. Nobody knew he was relatively outside of martial arts. I said, he just needs to walk out and look left and right. We need 30 seconds. Can I just stay here and keep the first class passengers back? And she looked at me and she said, okay. So that's exactly what happened. I go up to the front. Chuck follows me. And they open the door. He walks out. He looks left, looks right. That because Bruce couldn't afford, his budget couldn't afford filming that scene. Yeah. So we filmed our actual arrival. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of flip filming on the fly in Rome, wasn't there? Because you didn't have correct permits is that right like particularly for the coliseum like the shots that you got there were very um ad hoc or you knew someone working there or something well i arranged that yeah uh, Bruce, bruce's fantasy was to film in the coliseum or yeah. coliseum and and uh but it was closed for health reasons it had been closed for several years but my wife is sicilian yeah and one of her uncles used to run michigan so I made a call home, and when I found out, and I asked her if we had any connections, and she gave me a number in Sicily, and I called over there, and the next day they were over in a limo, because we're in Rome, they're in Sicily, way far away. They came up to the room with Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee and I, and they wanted a huge sum, and Bruce just said, I, I, I just don't have the budget. The whole budget was 250 mm. So they said, okay, and they left. So I walked out with him and I said, you know, my wife's uncle's Jack DeSimone. I said, is there any way you could help me out here? I said, this budget's really low. Anyway, we negotiated a low, much lower fee. And uh, I went back up and I said, hey, we can get it for blah, blah, blah. Way lower. Done. We jumped in their limo and went to the bank, got the money, and that's how we got in the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. We got to shoot in there because all of a sudden, by magic, it wasn't closed anymore for health reasons. So we were in there alone for two weeks. It was just amazing wow. to see these little cages that Christians lived in before they died, before they went to the lions. And there were several floors in there, but we got to wander all over there. And it was an amazing lesson that Bruce gave Chuck and I right there on that sacred ground, because that's when he taught us how to take punches and kicks by the string line. And it was just, I, I remember one day I was reading a book and Bruce came up to me and said, what are you doing? 
I'm reading a book, not in the scene. You should be behind a camera. You should be telling me if this is a hit or a miss. You, I, I didn't know I could go near the camera. Yeah, you should be behind a camera. Get over here. Look here. Tell me if that's a hit or a miss. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I never sat on my butt again. <laughs> he taught us so much. The guy was a genius about film fighting. You know, he'd done 20 movies with his dad from 5 to 13. Yeah. His dad was an amazing comedic actor. A lot of people don't know that. But Bruce was brilliant, fun, funny, kind, deep, intense, hardworking, amazing, mm. handsome, chiseled. I love that kid so much. I still miss him. And Freddie Prince and Steve McQueen. Those are my three favorites. I miss yeah. all three of them. They all got taken way too young. Freddie yeah. at 22, Bruce at 32, Elvis at 42, and Steve McQueen at 50. Yeah. Ben, this is why you must appreciate the great people in your life. Yeah. Why you got them. Yeah. Because there's a guarantee they're going to be here tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Did you just go on the flight over for a bit of a, because you thought it would be, you know, fun to see a bit of Rome and do a bit of sightseeing? Or would, were you harboring an ambition to make it in the movies? Was it something that, you know, because Bruce Lee would have been so passionate about it. Did it sort of rub off on you a little bit or were you not, <laughs> were you just there to support Chuck? No, I had never, I never did and never would and never will have any desire to be an actor and be in films. I only wanted to go on the trip to be with Bruce and Chuck. Yeah. It just turned out that I could add a few things. And it's on that set when I taught Bruce the crescent kick, which he never knew. Yeah. And two weeks later, he says, put your hand out. Put my hand out. What? He almost broke my hand. That's a little SOB. I said, oh, my God. Bruce was so amazing. But no. Uh, years later, he asked me to do Into the Dragon, my character, which in the script was old Kata, which I'm now getting ready to sell all that stuff off. But I, I changed it. I said, look, I'm not Japanese. I'm, I'm, I'm Irish, so it's going to be O'Hara. So I yeah. made my own name up. But anyway, um, call me and ask me to do the part. Now, when I got there, he said, oh, you're here. Okay, 75 a week. That's what I got. $75 a week, room and board, for doing Way of the Dragon. Wow. I was not there to be in the movie. I was there just to be with Bruce and Chuck, whom I love, both of them, very yeah. much. But he must have created a role for you then, Bob, to be in in that movie as one of the you know one of the baddies, one of the goons. Well, yeah, and the thing people don't realize, there never was a script for Way of the Dragon. Yeah, it was all Bruce Lee's head, so he made up everything daily, fight scenes, action, where it was going. Basically, a country bumpkin who doesn't speak Italian going to Italy and gets you know pushed around or attempted to be pushed around by thugs, da 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 but there was yeah. no script. Yeah. Then we went back to Hong Kong and uh and there Chuck Norris got death threats from the local Hong Kong guys. And Bruce said, Oh, you can't accept these and of course they didn't know I was coming, so I didn't get any death threats. And Chuck was pretty upset because Chuck Norris is one of the baddest, toughest, roughest, great men of all time. Yeah. But everybody kind of thinks he's a you know, kind of a easy guy, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, I worked out with him 48 years. Nobody has ever hit me harder than Chuck Norris. The way you look could look at that movie is that you know this is the Chinese hero showing his style, and the Chinese style is better than you know here's these Westerners who have come over and I'm gonna kick their ass kind of thing. Did it feel like that at the time, or were you just you were happy to just go along with it, whatever you know Bruce had in his head? Well. It, for people to understand this, Bruce raised the money. Bruce yeah. was the producer. Bruce was the star. So Chuck Norris and I are old-fashioned. If you're writing us a check, we should do what you want. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't feel like rocking the boat or anything then? The only time it matters what we want is when we're writing the check. Yeah. <laughs> we happily went with the opinion of how can we make it better how can we help bruce look better all right mm -hmm. and then the fact is that there was no ego about it but what it did was it inspired chuck's real name is carlos ray norris carlos ray then got excited and and it created a whole career for him yeah. so how could he possibly be resentful of losing to bruce lee it wasn't a tournament chuck and i were both world champions 
world professional champion several times. Yeah. So we, we had no resentment. But back to the original question, no, I never had a desire then or now. As a matter of fact, after the end of the Dragon, Warner Brothers offered me a three-picture starring role, and I turned it down because my wife and I discussed it. And for a variety of reasons I don't need to go into here, but we just thought it wasn't the right career for me. And I make so much money in real estate. And the problem is when you're famous, see, fame is a double edged sword. Hmm. I taught Elvis, Jack Pounce, Brian Keith, Paul Newman, Gustav, Steve McCree, Freddie Prince, and Bruce, and on and on and on and on and on. And fame is really ugly up close and personal. Fans don't give you love, they give you adulation. So after a while, fame becomes wearing. So Chuck and I always used to laugh because he always said, Chuck Norris said, I want to be famous. I said, me, I just want to be famous at the bank. I don't want anybody to know me except my banker. When I walk into the bank, Mr. Wall, your vault is ready. I got what I wanted. He got what he wanted. Yeah. But I turned down a three-picture starring role. I got the same day that Jim Kelly got his. And I hired Jim Kelly for Into the Dragon. Wow. It wasn't a career for me. Okay. But you must have seen then, particularly by the time you're then in Hong Kong filming Enter the Dragon, did you notice quite a difference in Bruce Lee's personality? Had he changed quite a bit in those years with the, the fame that he'd had? He was a superstar. Um, and did you notice a change in him then? Well, yeah, there was a change, but it was only that Bruce got kinder, smarter, funnier, it was everything he dreamed of. He wanted to be famous. It worked for him. It did not work for Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris really doesn't like his fame. Yeah. He's, it's wearing. But Bruce loved it. Now, I don't know how it would have been 10 years later, but no, he actually, Bruce loved it. He's one of the few celebrities. Um, Elvis didn't like it. Steve McQueen didn't like it. Um, Brian Keith, Paul Newman. So many of my students did not like it. But mm -hmm. Bruce Lee was the exception. He loved it. It was perfect for him. His, his, his ego was so in place. He knew who he was. And uh, so he's the one exception, I think, that really, really enjoyed that fame. But bear in mind, he only got that film, uh, the fame, maximum three years during his life. Yeah. So after a while, I mean, Chuck Norris lives way out in the boonies <laughs> where it's hard for people to get to him. Yeah. Where did he go after the June Reef funeral? He had to leave immediately. I went out and signed 2,000 autographs and took 2,500 pictures. Well, I don't mind that, okay, because then I can leave and nobody knows who I am. But Chuck Norris can't leave because everybody knows who he is. Yeah. One of my big shopping centers here in Tarzana, California, has four restaurants. And I went to all the owners and I said, when Chuck and I come in, or if he comes by himself or with his family, do not let anybody bother him. Let him eat his meal. Let him go to the bathroom. Afterwards, he'll sign autographs and take pictures. Okay, give him some respect. Yeah. And I remember Steve McQueen telling me, the last autograph he signed, he was in an airport trying to catch a plane, ran into the urinal, and was standing there doing his business, and a guy runs up with a pad and says, can you give me an autograph? <laughs> well, I'm a little busy right now, and I'm, but i got to catch a plane. So... Fans sometimes don't realize that you're a real human on a schedule and you really don't want to sign an autograph with your equipment in your hand. No. You prefer to wash your hands first. So, yeah. <laughs> but fame, for my money, my fame is perfect. I have the perfect fame on earth. In the wake of Bruce Lee's death, you know, there was a lot of Bruce Lee spin-off movies. There's a lot of movies that sort of trade on Bruce Lee's name and image. Uh, were you offered, you must have been offered in Hong Kong, you must have been offered movies like that after Enter the Dragon. Many, many, yeah. many, many. I turned them all down because, first of all, most of them were crap projects. Yeah. I, only, I, did, I did 26 Walkers. I did 12 of Chuck's films. Yeah. I, it, the films I've done are from my friends, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee, and I did... If peer in and stunt coordinate Black Belt Jones, uh, Jim Kelly was a good friend. I love the kid. Did a great job in Into the Dragon. And I stunt coordinated his film, Black Belt Jones. Mm. But then they offered me another one, and I said, no, thank you. You know, I'm making 10 to 12 grand a week. It stunt coordinating then paid 1700 a week, so I hired Pat Johnson, one of my Black Belts. Yeah. But to each their own. 
We all have to decide. You must be incredibly pr- proud of Enter the Dragon and the work that you did in that film. I mean, it's 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 such an iconic role, isn't it? Do you do you have you do you watch it much? Like, do you go do you go back and put it on? It must be on. It's on telly all the time, isn't it? You know, I haven't watched it in twenty five years. But what happens is, I do these Bruce Lee seminars, and almost everybody plays a little clip of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I, but what I'm really proud of is Bruce Lee. Because the poor guy got cut short 32 years. The guy was such a genius. He, I wish he was here today. But, yeah, I'm proud to have been in it, to have been a part of it. But it was a Bruce Lee movie. And, and Bruce is a legend. He deserved to be the legend. He created it. He, he and Freddie Weintraub, without those two, and we just lost Freddie. Yeah. Freddie was brilliant. Without Freddie Weintraub, there would have been no Enter the Dragon. He was a genius, another genius. So two geniuses got together and for $850,000 produced the second highest grossing film in martial art in, in, in Warner Brothers history yeah. and number one highest grossing movie in martial arts history. So 44 years later, nobody has been able to outgross Into the Dragon. Now that right. shows genius of Freddie Weintraub and Bruce Lee, both God bless them. They're in heaven somewhere. But yeah, I was just proud to be in that company. You took some hits as well <laughs> to, in that movie. Well, you know, I perfected. I'm the one on earth. I perfected how to take punches and kicks. And yeah. so Bruce and I were really close. We trained for almost 11 years. And he knew my thing was I had perfected how to take punches and kicks. So before every scene, because we were close, close, close friends, he said, well, I'm going to break something. Ah, you little Chinaman, you can't break anything. So... <laughs> My favorite picture of it is Bruce and I at the end of the movie. Uh, Dave Friedman took this brilliant photo of, um, he was the Warner Brothers official photographer, Bruce and I hugging each other. So it's sideways. So we don't sell near as many as the one of us facing the camera, but it said everything because you had to shoot the scenes five or six or seven times. But Bruce and I knew full impact, full contact. Yeah. When you're trying to knock the crap out of somebody, you can't beat the reaction because it's real. Yeah, yeah. And I think that there is a level of like authenticity in Bruce Lee's fight scenes, particularly with yourself, Bob. Um, you know, and that's in Way of the Dragon. It's in that fight with O'Hara and Enter the Dragon as well. The, they, they feel very visceral. It's very hard hitting. And it's completely different to the type of movies that, that were being made around that time, early 70s. It was unheard of to see a fight scene like that. So do you put that down to the fact that you had that relationship with Bruce, which was very uh, physical, wasn't it? And it was, that was the way you trained. Yeah, we were training partners. We were professional fighters who could take it yeah. and did it because we wanted this to be the best martial arts film of all time. And you know what? In my opinion, we did it. Yeah, absolutely. The second best film was Game of Death. Yeah, <laughs> which you were in. My locker room scene with Bruce. And I, part of it's real Bruce. A lot of dummies don't realize it, but I could show you. Yeah. We took it out of the original uh, Game of Death. But the fact is, in my opinion... The three greatest martial arts fight films are Chuck Norris and Way of the Dragon with Bruce, Bob Wall within the Dragon with Bruce, and Bob Wall with Bruce Lee in Game of Death. They're, and they're the three highest grossing martial arts films of all time. Yeah. Huh. What's yeah. the commonality? Yeah. <laughs> Lee, Chuck Norris, Bob Wall. Yeah. You don't need to make any more martial arts movies, Bob. You've already been in the best ones. Well, you know, it's like having a great parent or yeah. a great child a great wife or husband when you've got you've been in with the best you just have to say thank you god do you remember hearing about his death where where were you when you heard about yeah him? we were i was with freddie weintraub and we were up at a college in west l.a we were filming black belt jones uh, fight scenes and linda called us we went to the phone freddie took the phone and Bruce Lee, one of the greatest martial artists, one of the greatest athletes of all time, was the worst effing driver of all time. <laughs> he said, Bruce died. And I went, car accident. He goes, car accident? Linda goes, no, they don't know. He just passed out. But I, he would be driving, and I would shove his face, he would be turning looking at you, and I'd shove his face to the road. <laughs> He'd turn to you, and I'd shove his face to the road. So wow. I was just got killed in a car accident. But no, that's where I was, and it was a sad day. And you know what? 44 years later, I could still cry 
that's how much I love Bruce Lee. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just such a, well, just so young as well. It's just so tragic when anyone so young loses their life anyway, but just because he's on the cusp there, isn't he? He's literally at the moment in his career that, you know, he had been training and working so, so hard to achieve. And it's literally within weeks, you know, it's within his grasp, isn't it? It's so yeah. sad. And it was July 23rd when he died and the film Into the Dragon did not come out until August 15th. So he didn't even get to live to see it. Yeah. It's just tragic. So when I do the seminars all over the world, hopefully someday in England or Ireland, I tell them all. I said, you guys all love Bruce Lee because he was the first brilliant, handsome, talented martial artist to marry martial arts to ballet on screen. And he had the charisma to carry it off. But if you took away his martial arts skills, you'd love to hang with him. Because he was kind, he was fun, he was funny, and he was absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, the career he could have had, but I have to focus on, thank God, we got him, as long as we did, five films, and then his son got to do five films. So, thank God. You remained close with the Lee family then after he after he passed? You, you, you still remain quite close to them? Absolutely. I told Linda right away. I said, Linda, I will always be here for you and Bruce. And a lot of his advanced students blew out because he's dead. He can't do me any more good. Nope. We're very, very, very close to this day. Yes. Matter of fact, I had an Into the Dragon party at my house a few years ago, two months before Jim Kelly died. Yeah. I realized we'd been at the uh, uh, Academy Awards, and all of us, everybody in the cast and crew, had been there to answer questions to about a 1,000 Academy members and we signed autographs up the butt, of course, for free. Yeah. And I decided to have an Enter the Dragon party. So I had everybody, underline, capitalize, everybody, come to my home. I said, bring all the posters you want. I set up, I have a big home, big mansion, and I set up a big room. And I had everybody, including Linda and Shannon Lee, everybody came. Freddie Weintraub, Lalo Schifrin, everybody. And Freddie Weintraub, of course. And Jim Kelly, the last things he signed were at my house at the end of the dragon park so we've got i still got about a half a dozen of those posters signed by everybody from linda lee to to uh, jim kelly to me to freddie weintraub and that was really important to all of us so we at least the families got one poster signed by everybody if he was still around now what do you think he would um what do you think he would have done first of all he was very kind and very bright he was always way ahead of everybody about almost everything film fighting wise he would have produced some amazing martial arts films and if, if, if it's 44 years later and you still can't find anybody to beat him imagine what he would have done so yeah. it's crime against nature because he's the first asian man to become a worldwide leading man and i go all over the world i've been over 100 countries i like to spread the word bruce can't talk anymore so i get to talk for him yeah but he, he was a genius he was ahead of his time and I can't even imagine the things that brilliant brain would have spurted forth. Yeah. But it would have been martial arts magic on film. So I look back and just say, you know, how lucky can I get? I leave home at 13 with $2.58. Buy 25, I'm worth a couple mil. Yeah. I'm married 49 years to the love of my life. I got to know and train Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, Brian Keith, Paul Newman, Oki Summer, Steve McQueen, Freddie, all these celebrities. I taught three presidents in and out of the White House, Ford, Reagan. And, and Bush Sr., I've lived the most blessed life of any human alive because of the martial arts. And Bruce Lee did as well. We all had our challenges, but then we had our victories. And it was yeah. all thanks to martial arts. But he was a true martial artist. He was just an amazing man. Yeah. I am so proud to just have been his friend. Bob, I can't let you go without talking a little bit about Alvis. Uh, <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Your connections to Alvis, can you just explain that a, a, a little bit? Because you say that you, you you taught Alvis and Priscilla, is that yeah, right? Yeah, Priscilla is actually one of Chuck Norris's and my Red Bluffs. Fantastic, yes. And so, you know, we uh, loved Elvis and Priscilla. You know, Priscilla's raised her kids at my house. Yeah. But Elvis was a wonderful guy. Um, quite different than his public image because I remember resentfully when I was in high school, 55, 56, and I graduated in 57 when Elvis was just really coming up. And Elvis was evil. Every preacher yeah. I've heard said he was evil. But his whole center was gospel music. Yeah. 
so he came from the religious music. He was a soul music guy, but he realized his skills all came from gospel. So anytime we were at his house, he rented a house in Malibu, he rented a house, I mean, in Beverly Hills, rather, and a house in uh, Palm Springs. The only home he owned was Graceland. But anytime you were at the house with him, he wanted to sing gospel. He didn't want to do his popular tunes. He was a real good Christian man. Yeah. And he was into the martial arts. He studied and he was into it, wasn't he? It wasn't like, it wasn't for show. No, he actually made black belt with a guy named Art Shemansky when he was in the army. Yeah. And then I saw him. And, uh, you know, he, uh, we kind of improved his skill set a bit. Um, but, yeah, he actually invited Chuck Norris and I to his grand opening, 1968, at the International Hotel. And he sat us ringside. Behind us was Frank Sinatra. Wow. And the only four people in that entire room, which held 2,200 people, Rowan and Martin, I mean, you name it, every celebrity from maybe Van Dorn, they were all there sitting behind us. And the only two people he introduced all night was Chuck and I. <laughs> really? There's the greatest crowd of people, blah, 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 blah. And he had Joe, his road manager, take us back. And we spent several hours. His dad was the bartender, and it was amazing. He just was a fabulous guy. But yes, I, if you just imagine, six years out of high school, I'm teaching Elvis, and he was just a great man. I loved him. And it's like Bruce, I miss him. Is there something that you spot in the people that you teach? Is there something that that you can notice in someone that's where you can be like, yeah, they're going to be a great fighter one day. They've got the discipline. What do you need to have to, to, to make it as a good martial artist? Well, you know, not everybody wants to be a world champion. Yeah. Each person gets what they want or need out of it. Bruce Lee needed to be the best film fighter. He became that. Chuck Norris became needed to become the greatest karate fighter. He got that. Mm. So Elvis was an entertainer, and he really helped martial arts. He actually produced a film about martial arts fighters. Yeah, he wrote a script. He wrote a martial arts film, didn't he? I've, I remember seeing it. Um, I don't know if that's in Graceland's, but there's a script somewhere that Elvis wrote that he was trying to get off the ground, like a martial arts film. That's right, isn't it? He actually produced a film. Yeah, all uh, right. Martial arts film, but he loved martial arts. But it wasn't like music was his passion. Yeah. Chuck Norris's passion was fighting and being a good Christian. Bruce Lee's passion was being the greatest film fighter. Steve McQueen was on the murder list from the Manson group. So he wanted to protect himself. And he became a bad mother. Yeah. One year of training, he was could have gone into competition and succeeded, maybe not. But he would kick your ass in the street. Same with Freddie Prince. I mean... I knocked out Freddie a couple of times. In the ninth month I'm training him, he split my eye open. Wow. And he ran out of the house and got a towel and came back out and sopped the blood. And he left his bag and he jumped in his blue Corvette and he raced home. And about 45 minutes later, his wife calls me, and who's still a family friend like Linda is. And she says, you know what that crazy Freddie's doing? I said, what that crazy Freddie doing? I know he left his bag here and he, he, he left before the class is over. He's making a frame. He's writing on it. This is Bob Wall's blood. Well, that's what makes me proud because he wanted to be a tough guy and he became a tough guy. So good, I introduced him to Muhammad Ali and he got to spar with Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Wow. So, yeah, each person kind of gets what they want out of it. So, just quickly, so World Black Belts, that's your sort of current uh, project at the moment then, is it? Well, uh, 53 founding members, Chuck Norris, Gene LaBelle, Joe Lewis... Uh, Don the Dragon Wilson, Cynthia Rothrock, Kathy Long, a bunch of us, 53 of us, started it years ago, kind of as a gift back to martial artists. And we had a lot of people for years, they said, well, we can't join, we're not a black belt. I said, well, should we change the name to World White Belt? Would you join that? Yeah. Well, okay. It's for anybody who admires or aspires to be a black belt. And we have the black belt credit card. We have KO Fitness Strength. We have discounts. We have 3,700 products. If you go to Bob Wall with an S, worldblackbelt.com, you'll see 3,700 products. We give discounts. So the idea is they can communicate. They get an email, and it could be Bob Wall at worldblackbelt.com, Chuck Norris at worldblackbelt.com, Ben Johnson at worldblackbelt.com. Yeah. And nobody has to wonder what your email is. They just put in your name at World Black Belt. So it's an amazing communication vehicle, and it's the largest 
martial arts organization in the world. And you're still fighting fit. You're feeling good. I know you're saying you're 78, but um, you're you're feeling good. Heart rate of 52, and I'm ready to fight anybody, anywhere, anytime. Got the money. Yeah. I'm <laughs> Thank you, Bob. You take care. Have a blessed day. You have been listening to a conversation from the Kung Fu Movie Guide podcast archive. For more episodes, head over to kungfumovieguide.com and wherever it is that you get your podcasts. You can also contact the show and keep up to date with all of our latest news via social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And you can also email us. The email address is hello at kungfumovieguide.com. Thank you so much for listening to this and until we meet again, do take care and bye for now.